Well, if you remember, we <clears throat> started in Lesson 1, just sort of gave some information about the Bible. And Lesson 2 kind of was a big thing in the Bible. And Lesson 3 was the Old Testament. Lesson 4 was the New Testament. Now, Lesson 5, if you notice at the top, it's just called timeline. And what we're going to do is take some time, look at four or five or six different ways in which you can actually put the Scripture together. Because that's really the key, is to be able to, to see how it fits. Whereas when you think about the Bible, it's a big book. It's one book, and yet how many books? 66 books. And it's got one central theme, that there's all kind of stories, all kind of messages, all kind of principles, all kind of people, all of those things flowing through there. Remember we said this, if you had to put in one sentence what the Bible is all about, what would you say? Let me erase this real quick so we can just kind of put it up here. What would we say the Bible is about if you had to put it in one sentence? It's the perfect God, sinful man, back to himself, using his son, Jesus Christ. That's the story of the Bible. Perfect God brings sinful man back to himself using his son, Jesus Christ. That's the, that's the story. The, Bible, the story of the Bible is reconciliation. Some people want to say the story of the Bible is salvation. Be careful when you say that because there's justification salvation, sanctification salvation, and glorification salvation. So if they say salvation, you say which one? But the story of the Bible is really reconciliation, how God brings man to himself. That's the plan. <clears throat> the central person of the Bible is who? Jesus Christ. Everything flows around Christ. Getting all the way back <coughs> in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, everything is looking forward to the coming Messiah. You get to the New Testament. Of course, this is all Old Testament, but you get to the New Testament, and everything looks back to the Messiah who came. And when you think about all the little deals, the seed of woman, the seed of Abraham, you see in the book of Revelation, there he is sitting on the throne as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And so everything starts in Genesis, and in a sense, everything, a lot of people want to say, well, the consummation is everything is in Revelation. It's not the consummation. It's not the end. It's the beginning of eternity because what happens is when you get to the book of Revelation, you get to the end times, you get to Jesus Christ on the throne, you get to the new heavens and new earth and new Jerusalem and for all eternity. So it doesn't ever end. There's not an ending. So there's some great things there. What we want to do tonight is talk about the, all the, the different ways that we can put the Bible together. And this should help you because, you know, you think, okay, I've got an idea. I know Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I know what they're about. I know a little bit about Romans. I know some of the letters. I know Paul's stuff. And you thought, remember how we talked all the way through the Old Testament that time? So you got a big idea of the Bible. One key thing is to be able to put it together because when you talk to people and they say things, you need to know where do these things fit. If I just said David or if I said Elijah, would you know where he is? Where does he fit in the scripture? At what time period? If we just said Abraham, or if we said Noah, or if we said Paul or Peter or any of those, would you say, okay, where do they fit in the Bible? If I just said Babylonians, where do they fit? How does all this stuff work? And so one of the things you want to be able to do is to put together the scripture. Let's think about the Bible, and let's talk about some ways to divide the Bible. Let's talk about the biggest way to divide the Bible. What's the, the biggest way to divide the Bible? You can divide it into two big sections. What would you say? Old Testament, New Testament. And what does the word testament mean? <clears throat> it's a covenant. A, test a testament is a covenant. And when you say Old Testament, Old Covenant, New Testament, New Covenant. That's what it is. Uh, and, and that's the idea of how the Bible fits together. Now, let's do this. That I've got for you right at the start there, that, that the Bible can, there are five major sections of the Bible. Let me erase all this, and we'll put them up so you can see how it fits. In other words, if you said, let's divide the Bible, you can divide it into two parts, old and new. You can divide it into five parts. And here's the first section. Section number one begins in Genesis chapter 1 and goes through Genesis chapter 11. Genesis 1 through Genesis chapter 11. And we call that the age of the Gentiles. It begins with Adam and Eve. And it goes, when you think about it, it goes from Adam and Eve up until the time that God chose Abraham. So Genesis 1 through 11 is called the age of the Gentiles. Because on the face of the earth, Gentile, the word Gentiles comes from ethnos. And it comes from the word, the idea of nation. So these are people. You remember there was Adam and Eve. And then they had two sons. And how many sons did they have? Huh? Well, at least three. I mean, there's no telling how many kids they had. I mean, when, when they went off and got married to people, who did they get married to? The brothers and sisters, the cousins or something, right? And, and so 
There's Adam and Eve and then Cain and Abel and then Seth and then others and then Noah and then after that comes... So you see all these people and you see the flood and you see people dividing. All of that's in Genesis 1 through 11. That's the first section of the Bible, age of the Gentiles. Here's the second section, beginning in Genesis chapter 12 to Acts chapter 2. It's called the age of the Jews. It begins with Abraham. And it really goes all the way, actually, uh, through Christ to the beginning of the church. We'll talk more about that. But so it's Genesis 12 to Acts 2. Think about it. There's Abraham and then Isaac and then Jacob and then Joseph and Judah's in right there with him. And he goes all the way down to David and he goes to Solomon and just keeps on going until it gets all the way. There's John the Baptist. It gets all the way up to Jesus. And then Jesus dies and rises again and walks on the earth for 40 days and sends into heaven. That's all this time period. In fact, if you look at the Bible beginning in Genesis chapter 12, you've got Genesis, Exodus, Begittus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, all those books. And that's all the age of the Jew. Okay? The third part starts in Acts. And we can, you can say Acts chapter 2 to <clears throat> Revelation chapter 3. And this is called the age of the church because beginning in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost the church began the Holy Spirit came down Jesus had walked on the earth for 40 days sent into heaven 10 days later Holy Spirit comes down and baptizes believers puts them in Christ and that's the beginning of the church and so starting in Acts chapter 2 going all the way to the book of Revelation chapter 3 we find what we call the age of the church that's what we're in now right what are we called we're called the church. We're called the body of Christ. We're, that's who we are. Then the fourth big section begins in Revelation chapter 4. Revelation 4 and goes to Revelation 19. And this is called the tribulation. And that's the time period after the church is taken off the face of the earth. There is a seven year time period. A peace pact made with the, with the Antichrist and the nation of Israel. And that seven-year time period begins with the first three and a half years. It's called the tribulation. The last three and a half years is called the great tribulation. And that's that time period. And people always talk about it. We always say, what about the tribulation? What about this? And the Left Behind series and all the books and everything. And, and it's the truth. And we'll talk about it, especially when we get toward the end, which will be, have to be next, you know, next semester when we get toward the end. When we get into the end times events, we'll go into more teals, details on that. The last section is Revelation chapter 20 through Revelation 22. And that's called the kingdom and the eternal state. That's a new heavens and a new earth and new, Jer new Jerusalem. So there's a kingdom on the earth which lasts for how long? Anybody know? A thousand years and then the eternal state which goes on and on and on and on. You can look in the Bible and you can say, well, if I'm in this section, God's dealing with what people? Gentiles. If I'm in this section, he's primarily dealing with what people? Jews. If we're in this section, he's dealing with who? The church. Well, if we're in this section, he's dealing with this time period called the tribulation. And if we read this section, we're saying it's the kingdom and the eternal state. And so when you're reading the Bible, that helps you break it down because when you're reading First and Second Samuel... You say, well, that's time of the Jews. I mean, that's going to be the Jewish people. Abraham to Isaac to Jacob to Judah to David to Solomon. And, all, and that all fits in that kind of stuff as we studied that one night. So you can actually take the Bible and you can divide it into two big parts, old and new. You can divide it into five parts, basically dealing with how God deals with different people. Now, to understand how we divide the Bible this way, we need to understand a term. Some of you may have never heard this term. Some of you may have heard it a lot but it is the word dispensation. It, 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 it really has, has an idea of a responsibility, uh, 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 something, but a dispensation is, and here's a definition if you want to write it down, a uh, dispensation is a period of time. <coughs> a dispensation is a period of time in which God deals with man in a specific way. A dispensation is a period of time in which God deals with man in a different way. 
Now, you understand that God doesn't deal with people in the same way all the way through the Bible. I mean, he didn't deal with Adam and Eve and some of these people in the same way he dealt with these people, and he didn't deal with these people the same way he deals with us. There's going to be different dealings during the tribulation, and there's going to be different ways that he deals with people during the kingdom. I mean, think about it this way. If you lived at the time of King David, right, and you sinned, what did you do? You suppose, you, you, if you did a certain sin, where were you to go? You were supposed to go to the temple because there was a sacrificial system going and there was a priesthood and the tribe or Levi was doing that. And so you were Jewish, you would go up there and you would take a certain animal to be sacrificed, right? But now, if you sin, what do you do? You confess your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive you. Uh, does that seem easier? Why did he make us do sacrifices? Well, uh, and w because, actually, because there's already been the final sacrifice. So he doesn't deal with us in the same way, right? Did he deal with Adam and Eve in the same way he dealt with King David? No. And does he deal with the people in the church age different than he dealt with the people in the age of the Jews, you might say? He does. So when we say dispensation, you just realize that God deals with people in different ways. And Now, here's what I want to show you. And I, there, that oftentimes, there are different ways people divide the Bible in what they call dispensations. But I've got for you what we call, and that most people who divide the Bible this way Divide there, there are seven dispensations. Now, let me show you something. <clears throat> You're in your lesson five, I think. And at the very end of lesson five, there's a purple page and a couple of pink pages. Or I don't know why we got pink in here because I hate pink. But anyway, there's orange and, and blue. And all. But if you notice, there's a blue page, and then there's yellow pages. And if you notice, the yellow pages at the title of it says dispensations. I don't want you to look at it right this second, but I have a lot of details for you on dispensations on how God deals with mankind in different ways. We'll come back and talk about that in a little bit. Now, so don't look at that anymore. Go back to the section. There are seven dispensations. Let me give you the dispensations. And I'll give you the name of it and a little bit about it, and then we'll, we'll talk more about it. The first dispensation is what they call innocence. Innocence. And this is before the fall. So let's think about this. I'm going to erase this part right here. So who is innocence? How, who is God dealing with in the dispensation of innocence? Adam and Eve, yeah, because there's only two people, right? He created the man, and then he created what? The woman. Um, what did Adam do before he realized that he was alone? You remember? What did he do? Named all the animals. All the animals came by, and he named them all. And, and, and Adam thought, you know, there, there's nothing here that really matches me. So, uh, I mean, elephants don't match. I mean, let's just face it, right? And, and think about what happened. Uh, God puts him to sleep, takes out his rib, makes a woman. He, he wakes up, and he realizes he's had surgery, and he's now married. I mean, what a, <laughs> right? What a mess. He goes, God, what a mess. I mean, <laughs> Man, I mean, he said, what well, bummer of a day, you know. Uh, <laughs> but he actually, when he saw her, he, he, said, uh, he said, man, uh, that's some spicy meatball. But it, it actually, uh, the Bible says he said, bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. So he realized, he was, but that is in innocence because he put them there. Some people want to say that man was created perfect. Man wasn't created perfect. Man was created in innocence because God said, there's, you can do anything you want to do except you can eat from every tree except from one tree, which is the tree of what? The knowledge of good and evil. See, they were in a, a state of innocence, and they were to learn right and wrong by doing what? By doing right, but they learned right and wrong by doing what? Wrong. And so they failed. This is before the fall. So here is the dispens God dealt with man, and he said, you can do this, you can do this. How many things were there to do wrong? Only one thing. Think about it. And they still blew it, right? You'd say, oh, if that had been me, I, I wouldn't have done that. Yes, you would. Yes, you would. If you walk somewhere and it says, do not look through this hole, you go, uh, nobody telling me not to look through the hole, right? Because that's just what we do. And God said, don't eat from that tree. And they went, oh. Uh, and remember, what, we're going to see it in the, about three lessons from now. We're going to see where Satan comes and basically says, so God's lied to you, hasn't he? He didn't want you to eat the tree because if you eat the tree, you're going to be like him. He didn't want you to be like him. If he really loved you, he'd let you eat the tree. 
Well, he tricked them. So they fail. Innocence. Now, the next dispensation that God deals is what we call conscience. Okay? Conscience. And you can write out beside that after the fall. Because what happened after the fall? As soon as they ate the fruit, what did they know? They knew what? Well, yeah, well you brought that up, didn't you? Okay, well, anyway. <laughs> what did they know after they ate the fruit? They now knew what? Right from wrong. They had done wrong. They went and hid. And we're going to talk about it later, but when God comes to him and he says, Adam, did you eat the fruit? What does he do? Well, no, he didn't lie. He didn't lie. He just blamed her. And she looked at her and he was like, did you eat the What did you do? And she said, snake made me do it. He looked at the snake and he went, there's nobody else to blame. Right? So after the fall, he said, now that you know what? Right from wrong. What did he tell them to do? Do right, right? He, he kicked him out of the garden and said, now you got to do what? Now that you know right from wrong, what are you supposed to do? What did man do? Wrong. He did evil. In fact, the evil got so bad, what did God do? He destroyed. In fact, he destroyed everything except there was a man. His name was Noah. And Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And Noah and his wife and his three sons and their three wives, eight people, built an ark over 120 years, they got on that ark that God brought all the animals, two of every kind, got them on there, went on this flood, the flood came, they, they were on the ark 370 days. When they came off, there's a third dispensation, and it's called government. Because things have changed now. And government, if you remember in Genesis 9, verse 6, God said, you, you got to govern yourselves, and if someone kills someone, what happens? By the hand of man, that will that person will be what? Put to death. It's capital punishment. He said, you've got to establish a government. You've got to establish what you're supposed to do. And so we've had the innocence before the fall, conscience after the fall, government after the flood. Did, did I tell you to put after flood on that? Or did it just after gov by government put after the flood? And then mankind was supposed to spread out and form all these what? Nations and governments. But remember, they said they're not going to do that. In fact, what did they say they were going to do? They were going to stay in this big, this big flat area, and they were going to build this tower that reached to heaven called a ziggurat. That's what it was. They're there all over the world today, even in different places. They were going to do that, and God said, well, I'm not going to let them do that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to mix up their language. So all of a sudden, the guy talking to the guy, he can't understand anything this guy's saying. And he'll have to find people that talk like he does, and they'll have to get into different groups and spread out. And that place was called the Tower of what? Babel. Babel. And you know where that is? That's where Babylon is. Same place. Same place. Always been problems over there. <laughs> Always has. Okay, now, then God, he's dealing with man in a different way. After God, now, God then comes to a man, and his name is, well, let me give you the fourth one. The fourth one is called Promise. Because God comes to a man by the name of Abraham. And by the way, this promise time lasts from Abraham to Moses. I just want you to see that as a, as a way of breaking it down. Because God came to Abraham and made a promise to him. He said, Abraham, through you, all the nations of the world will be blessed. I'm sorry, I'm going to give you a land. I'm going to receive you a blessing. I'll give you all this stuff. I'm making all these promises to you. That's why we call it promise. And Abraham, he told Abraham to stay in the land. And what did Abraham do? Went right on to Egypt. God said, yeah, do y'all never listen to me? And, and think about us. What does he tell us to do? And what do we do? You know what God could say to us? Do y'all never listen to me? <laughs> That's what he says. And so in this time period, God dealt with man with promises. And then they ended up going into Egypt, and they ended up coming out by this man named Moses. And we get another section or another way that God deals with man called law. Is that the fifth one? It is, isn't it? Fifth one. It's called law, and this is from Moses to Christ. Okay? Moses to Christ. Who was under the law? Jewish people were. Were Gentiles under the law? Only if they chose to be. Only if they said, we want to worship the God of Israel and believe in the true God, they might put themselves under the law system. The law system wasn't for salvation. How was salvation? Simply by grace through faith. Exactly. Always that way. A lot of people have a misconception. And when they see law and they see the 613 commandments under the Mosaic law, they think that law has something to do with salvation. Law has something to do with fellowship, not salvation. Salvation is always faith. Always faith. We'll talk about it more in just a second. 
So it's always faith. But under, from Moses to Christ, they're under a law system. And boy, he dealt with them in a different way, didn't he? Okay, then we get to number six. And we call this the dispensation of grace. That's what a lot of people call it. And we could put out beside that, this is the church age. <clears throat> and the church age began uh, after Jesus died and rose again, walked on the earth 40 days, ascended to heaven 10 days later on the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. The Holy Spirit came down, placing them in Christ and forming what we call the church. And it's, also, it's just called the age of grace. Now, here's the thing. Is there a law in the age of grace? Yeah, the law of Christ, okay? Is there grace under the law? Yes, it's all grace and law, you know. When we say law, we're not talking about the 613 commandments. We're talking about principles and truths. There's a thing called the law of Christ. You know what the law of Christ is? It's called the law of love. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul. Love your neighbor as yourself. Then he says, and love others as I have what? Loved you. That's the law of Christ. That's why when you read in the New Testament, Paul, it'll talk about the law of Christ, and it's not talking about Mosaic law. So this is what we call the age of grace, and it is amazing to me how many people don't understand the age of grace, especially when you think of the salvation message. Uh, I went, I was at a place the other day, and, and I think I, I might have said this either in church or Sunday school, and I was hearing a guy, and he was, he was actually talking, and he was presenting. And he was doing John chapter 14. You know, believe in God, also believe in me. And he kept talking about believing in Christ and believing in Christ and the whole idea of salvation. And, and then he gets to the gospel part and he says, so to be saved, you do the following things. And he never said believe anymore. He said two or three other things. I want to say, now you read the passage and it talked about believe, but when you get ready to tell people how to be saved, you ask them to do something other than believing. Doesn't that make you mad? I wanted to go, hey, uh, you used to believe a lot. Why don't you use it now, Right? So let's, you know, the age of grace. Now, after what we call the age of grace, we have the, the last time period, and, so, and, and it's got a double name. And sometimes people call it the kingdom age. Sometimes people call it eternal state. You, you can say kingdom, and here's why. When you say the kingdom, what do you think of? Huh? Okay, you think of Jesus reigning. Where does he reign? On the earth. For how long? Thousand years. Well, that's the first part of the kingdom because Peter calls it the eternal kingdom. So the first thousand year reign of Christ on this earth, we call it the millennial kingdom. That's for a thousand. And then he rules on the new heavens and the new earth for all eternity. So you can call this the kingdom dispensation because we don't just mean the thousand year reign, but for all eternity. And if you want to write out beside that, that's after the tribulation. So you see that God dealt with man in innocence, different than he dealt with man in conscience, different than he dealt with man under government, different than he dealt with man under promise, different than he dealt with man under law, different when he dealt with people under grace, and it's going to be different in the kingdom and the eternal state. Now, here's the point I want you to make. Regardless of any kind of dispensation, regardless of how you break the Bible up, salvation is always how? By faith. What did Adam and Eve believe in? Oh, who did Adam and Eve believe in? Well, they believed God, yeah. And they saw him. But that didn't save them. Listen, does anybody believe, if people believe in God, are they saved? No. So just saying they believed in God didn't save them. What, what did they believe in for salvation? Uh, okay, but what was he called? He wasn't called Messiah there. Seed of woman, right? Seed of woman, Genesis 3.15 is going to crush the head of the serpent. They understood that. Abraham, what did Abraham believe in? It says Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. What did he believe God about? Huh? Okay, he believed the father of nations, but that didn't necessarily save him just because he's going to be the father of nations, right? Who was coming through him? Uh, through him, all the nations of the world will be blessed. How? Because the Messiah was coming through him. He believed that he was the father, that, he, that uh, the seed of Abraham was going to be the Messiah. He believed in the Messiah. Who did David believe in? His greater son. He said, I'm going to have a son who is the Messiah, who will sit on the throne of Israel forever, who is the Messiah and the king. They believed it. So they, now, they didn't know him by Jesus, right? In fact, the first group that even knew him by Jesus called him Jesus of what? Nazareth. Because they said, there's, there's this rabbi coming around. He's from Nazareth, Jesus of Nazareth. And we now call him who? 
Jesus Christ because Jesus is his personal name. Christ is his title. Jesus the Christ. And, and the word Christ, Christos, is Greek uh, for Messiah or anointed one. And Messiah is Hebrew, Mashiach, for the anointed one. So it's the same title. So if you said Jesus is the Messiah, that's the same as saying Jesus is the Christ. Same name, just one's Hebrew and one's Greek. So it's amazing when you think about it. Salvation is always the same way. It is by faith in God's promise, Savior. Sometimes it was seed of woman, sometimes it was seed of Abraham, sometimes it was the son of David, sometimes it was the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, sometimes it was Jesus of Nazareth. Whatever it was, that's what they believed in. And if you said, Abraham, who are you believing in? He'd say, my, my seed that's going to come through me is the Messiah. That's who I'm believing in. So it's amazing. Salvation is always by faith. Don't let anybody mess you up and say people in the Old Testament were saved by law. Nobody's ever been saved by law. Nobody's ever kept the law. Okay, now, with that in mind, I want to show you there's another way to break up the Bible. We've, we've broken it up old and new. We've broken it up five ways. We've broken it up seven ways. And now we break it up a different way. We're breaking it up Israel and what? The church. See that? We must always keep a distinction between the nation of Israel, which is the Jewish people, and the church, which is the body of Christ. Now, let's talk about this. <clears throat> God chose who to begin the Jewish people. Okay, so he, his, man, his name was Abram. Which meant Big Daddy. Had no kids. 70-something years old, no kids. What's your name? Big Daddy. Where's your kids? I don't have any. Okay. You know, that's what happened. I mean, let's think about it. I guess he figured someday I'm going to have them. And God made a promise to him. And God chose Abram and changed his name to Abraham, father of many nations, that there, there was going to be this people, which we call Jews. Now, the truth is, you've got, you've got these people were called Hebrews. Because Hebrew means one who crosses over. And they left the earth of the Chaldees and crossed over the Tigris Euphrates River to come to the promised land. So they were known as Hebrews. And then it was Abraham to Isaac and Isaac to Jacob. And Jacob got his name changed to Israel. And then they became known because they were descendants of Jacob. He had 12 sons. And they became known Israelites. And then later on, after they divided into a northern and southern kingdom, the southern kingdom was called Judah, and the northern kingdom was called Israel, and Israel was taken away, so the southern kingdom was called Judah, and the nickname for Judah was Jews. So that's why they say Jews or Jewish people, Israelites, Hebrews, that's where those names all came from. This was a people group that God chose. And it was Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And Jacob had 12 sons. And these 12 sons and his family ended up going down into Egypt, right? How many of them were there when they went into Egypt? It, 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 sometimes people think there were 75. Some people think there were 70. So there they are. We think that's the nation of Israel. 70 people. That's not a very big nation, right? I mean, I know family reunions that are bigger than this, right? Right? So what happened to them? They got stayed in. They got into captivity. All of these things. And when they came out some 420 years later, or 430, how many came out? 600,000 men, not counting women and children. So they believe that like 2.5, 2, 2 to 3 million came out. This is a people group we call the Jewish people, the Israelites. They're God's people. God made promises to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob and to David and to all of these people, okay? That's the Jew. There's another group of people which we call the church. The church is made up of Jews and Gentiles who believe in Jesus Christ as Savior. It started after Jesus died and rose again on the day of Pentecost. God forms what he calls the body of Christ, which, are, which is made up of Jews and Gentiles, which is called the church. Now, the church and Israel are not the same. The church does not replace Israel. The promises to the Jewish people... From Abraham to Isaac to Jacob to Judah to David. Those promises, if they haven't been fulfilled, they will be fulfilled. There are a whole group of people who do not take the Bible historically, literally, grammatically. And they say that these Jewish people didn't do right so God got rid of them and he's replaced them by the church. And there's some even people who say that the church is spiritual Israel. 
It is not true. It's not accurate in any way, shape, or form. God is not through with his Jewish people. If you read Romans 9, 10, and 11, he says, has God cast away his people? No way. Now, what I want to show you is there is a distinction. So we want to keep this distinction. I want you to write in that space. On one side, write Israel. And then a little bit on the other side, write the church. Just you know, kind of give a space so you can, can show a contrast, okay? Let's make a distinction between Israel and the church. Israel, first of all, is a nation. Is that true? Are they a nation of people? From beginning with Abraham to Isaac to Jacob to Judah, all the way through, they're a nation of people. The church is not a nation. The church is a what? It's a body. We're the body of Christ. Okay? Second, Israel is made up of Jewish people. Is that correct? The descendants of Abraham. Now, let me, let me, I want to clarify something for you so you can understand that. When you say Jewish people, Jewish people are descendants of Abraham through Isaac and Jacob. Abraham had two sons. Isaac and who? Ishmael. Jacob had two sons. I mean, Isaac had two sons. Who? Jacob and Esau. The promises were not to Ishmael. The promises were not to Esau. Jewish people are descendants from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob. That's Jewish people. Because Ishmael was a descendant of Abraham, but he's not Jewish. Okay, does that make sense? The promises came from Abraham, Isaac, to Jacob. So Israel is made up of Jews. The church is made up of who? Jews and Gentiles. If you're a Jewish person and you believe in Jesus Christ, do you, are you still a Jewish person? But what do you become? The church. If you're a Gentile and you believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior, are you still a Gentile? What do you become, though? The church. That's right. Okay. So Israel is uh, made up of Jews. The church is made up of Jews and Gentiles. Israel has a land. A land. What do we call it? The, we call it Israel. We call it the promised land. It's not one little bitty section. It, it actually stretches. Are you ready for this? It stretches from the River Nile to the Euphrates River. Go get a map sometime and look at the land area that God has promised his people. They've never possessed all of it. Not yet. They will. That was a promise. Unless we don't think these promises are true. We do think they're true. Okay. Israel has a land. The church has what? The whole world. The whole world. And finally, the church has, excuse me, Israel has the covenants. The covenants. And we've got one whole lesson later on, this second semester, we've got one whole lesson on all the covenants of the Bible, how they fit together, and I'll show you that. The church doesn't have the covenants. The church gets the benefits of the covenants. <clears throat> When Jesus was in the upper room and he was doing the Passover meal and he changed the Passover meal from what, what was called the Passover meal to what we call what? The Lord's Supper. And he said this is the blood of the what? The new covenant. Was the new covenant made with the church or was it made with the nation of Israel? It's made with the nation of Israel, not the church. The church isn't in existence then. And when Jesus died on the cross and shed his blood, was the church in existence? No. So just remember, the covenants were not made with the church. They were made with Israel, but the church gets the what? The benefits. Okay, does this make sense? Any questions? Okay, stop me if you got a question. Okay, we're going to go faster. Okay, I, I, I didn't realize I'm talking this slow. Okay, let's go a little faster. Let's look at time periods. Okay, so we've looked at old and new. We've looked at five big, big sections. We've looked at seven big sections. we looked at two sections saying... Jews, Gentiles. Now, let's look at time periods. And I'm going to give you just some round figures, okay? Just so it will help you put it together. From Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve lived about how many years before Christ? Yeah, that's, some people guess that. In fact, a guy by the name Usher said that it was 4,400 years from Adam and Eve to Christ. That was his guesses. Uh, when he did that, he tried to take the genealogies and go all the way through based on years. But what he didn't realize is when the Old Testament said somebody begot somebody, that didn't necessarily mean that was a father 
child. It could have been a father, a grandchild. It just meant they were a descendant of. So most people, if we're going to be very conservative, usually will say from Adam and Eve to Christ was between 10,000 and 6,000 years. And you could say 4,000 if you want to, because that fits as well, okay? Now, of course, a lot of people say it's millions of years and everything, but it's not, okay? Now, get this. You're going to see a little pattern here. From Abraham, Abraham was how many years before Christ? You ready? 2,000. How long ago has it been that Abraham lived on this earth? About 4,000 years. Okay, he was 2,000 years before Christ. Get this one. Moses lived about how many years before Christ? You ready? 1,500. Okay. Then David lived before Christ. Guess. Hmm? 1,000. That's about right. He actually lived 960-something, but we're rounding it to 1,000 just so you can get time periods, okay? And then Daniel lived about how many years before Christ? What do you think? You can say 500. It was between five and 600 years. So to help you memorize it or think about it, think of 6 to 10 and then, and then go 2,000, 1,500, 1,000, 500. So the next time you think of David and David and Goliath, think that David lived about 1,000 years before Jesus was born. That's amazing. Okay? Y'all got that one? Now comes the best one of all. 20 names, baby. We're going to get these 20 names, and you're going to be able to go through the whole Bible and think through the whole thing with 20 names. You ready? Okay, let's, yes, let's write them down. Here's number one. Who do you think is number one? Adam and Eve. Let's just put them both. We get, get them together. We don't want her to be left out and just say Adam. So we're going to put Adam and Eve. Okay? Who's next? Hmm? Hmm? We've got to get big people. We can't pick everybody, right? So Noah. Right. And Noah found what? Grace and the favor of grace in the eyes of the Lord. And Noah got on the ark. And after Noah got off the ark, people spread about everywhere. And then who was the next big person? Abraham. There he is. And Abraham was living there of the Chaldees. And God said, go to the land that I'm going to show you and then I'm going to give you. And he went down there. And he got the promises. And after Abraham was Isaac. That's right. And Isaac got the same promises. And after Isaac was Jacob. And Jacob had 12 sons. And there's Jacob. And, and when you think about Jacob, who, who is... Besides Judah, because everything's going to go through Judah. But who of the 12 sons of Jacob stands out, especially in the book of Genesis? Joseph. So you write him down. And they, went, they were in the captivity after Joseph died. And then who did God raise up? Moses. Okay. And then Moses takes them and they go through wandering around for 40 years and all these things. And then Moses dies. And who takes over? Joshua. Okay. And after Joshua, there was the time of the judges. We're not even going to list any of those guys because there were like a number of them in the cycle, seven different cycles of judges, and we know some of the judges. But there was a final judge. It, it's, it was Samuel, so that's the man, okay? And the reason that Samuel's so important, he was the last judge, but he also did something nobody else did. He anointed the first two kings of Israel. So after Samuel came who? Saul. He was the first king of Israel. Why did they pick him? He was the tallest one. He's the tallest one. I told you height is overrated. You've known that. You know? So anyway, he was the tallest one. And then who after Saul came who? David, the man after God's own heart. And after David came who? Solomon. And what did Solomon do? He built the temple. I mean, think about it. The, the greatest building ever built, probably. And he was the richest king that ever was. He was the wisest man that ever was. And just because you have wisdom and riches and power and authority... Doesn't mean you'll stay on the right path, and he didn't. He turned away from God at the end of his life. Isn't that amazing? Solomon? Now, let me help you on this. After Solomon, we, we, we think uh, through to, uh, to a couple of prophets that we just want to throw them in there. One was Elijah, and then probably the most famous of all the prophets. Who would that be? Isaiah, right. And after Elijah and Isaiah, they went into captivity, and who was the main person that you think of in captivity? Daniel. When Daniel was in the lion's den, was he old or young? He's probably in his 90s. You picture that? Did you always picture him as a little boy in the lion's den? Or you picture him as an old man in the lion's den? He's probably 90 years old. He'd been in captivity almost 70 years. If he'd gone off into captivity when he was 15, he'd be 85. Now, after Daniel, there was that 400 silent years, so to speak. And then who? John the Baptist. He's the voice crying in the wilderness, right? And following John the Baptist, who did John the Baptist point out? Jesus. 
And then who, who was the leader after Jesus died and rose again? Peter. And then who else was the leader after Peter? Paul. And then who was the last one? John. There you have 20 people that takes you from Adam and Eve to John, which is the end of the New Testament because John died in about 95. So don't look down. Let's do it. Adam and Eve, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Joshua, Samuel, Saul, David, Solomon, Elijah, and then Isaiah, and Daniel, and then John the Baptist, Jesus, Peter, Paul, John, and Ringo. No, I'm sorry. Not Peter, Paul, John, and Ringo. <laughs> you have to be a certain age to get that one. Some people are going, what are they talking about? They don't even know what we're talking about. All right. Y'all got that? Okay. Now, look at the last page, and we'll soon be through. The central person in the Bible is who? It's the Messiah. Everything. The Old Testament looks forward to the Messiah. The New Testament looks backward to the Messiah. In the Old Testament, the Messiah is called the seed of woman, the seed of Abraham, and the son of David. There it is. He's sometimes called the Messiah, the Lamb of God, the servant, the Christ, the Lord, the I Am, uh, the beginning of the end, the Alpha, the Omega, uh, the bread of life, the bread that came down from heaven. I mean, just think of what we've seen. In the, just, if you just took the seven I am's from John, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. I'm the resurrection and the life. I'm the, the, the door. I'm the vine, the branches. I'm all these things. That's who he is. He's every one of those. And some of y'all have seen those posters that have all the titles of Christ on them. It's, they're just full. There's all kinds of ways that he is described. We've seen the flow in the overview of the Bible as a whole. Now, let's do one other thing. You ready? Go to the purple sheet. And what do you have? You have a timeline that a, little, a girl drew this for me uh, probably 30-something years ago, okay? And this is kind of a little flow, and so you're going to write in the little blanks, the people. Are you ready? Let's go, go to the left side, <laughs> and we're going across that way, right? And notice how it's broken down, the age of the Gentile, the age of the Jew, the church age. Now, when we drew this up years ago, Sometimes what we call the tribulation, sometimes people call that the continued age of the Jew because they were back under a law system under the tribulation time period. So some people do that. And then the age of Christ is also what we call the kingdom and on, on forth. So let's start. you got this tree. Who's on one side? Who's on the left side? Eve. So fill it in. And who's on the other side? Adam. And they had two sons. One of them brought fruit and one of them brought an animal. Who brought the fruit? Cain. That's C-A-I-N, okay. <clears throat> and who brought the other? Abel. And then after one, after one, uh, uh, Abel died from Cain, who, who did they have after that? Seth, okay. Now, as we go along the timeline, there's this guy walking, and, and he walks up into heaven. Who is that guy? Enoch, right. Enoch walked with God, right? You remember one day he went out, and he never came back. They said, where did he go? I said, God took him. Somebody said, well, I don't think I'm going walking again. I, I don't think about, you know, right? Then we got the little boat, which the ark doesn't look like that. But who was that? Noah. And Noah had three sons. Who are they? Shem, Ham, Japheth. J-A-P-H-E-T-H. Okay? Now we're, we're through with the what? Who are we through with? The age of the Gentiles. We're starting something else. So who is the first Jew? Abram. Yeah, Abram, Abraham. Yeah. Now, Abraham is offering up who on that altar? Isaac. That's his son. And then Isaac has two sons. And one of them is cooking stew, and the other one wants some stew, so he sells his birthright. Who is the one bowing down wanting to get some of that stew? Esau. And who's the one giving it to him? That's Jacob. Who was later renamed what? Israel. And he had 12 sons. Do y'all know the 12 sons? Yeah, you do. You know them. Who's the first one? Starts with an R. Reuben. It's Reuben Sandwich. Just remember that. And then who's next? Simeon. 
S-I-M-E-O-N. Who's third? Levi. Levi Strauss. Okay. Who's fourth? Judah. J-U-D-A-H. Fifth? Dan. This is a little bit harder one. What is this one? Naphtali. Yeah. Oh, I can't read my own writing. You know, I can't spell. I can't read it. In, uh, that's N-A-P, isn't it? What is, how is it? Uh, yeah. Oh, who cares? Just put it down, right? Who's next? Gad. Who's after that? Asher, A-S-H-E-R. Who's after that? Ishakar, I-S-S-A-C-H-A-R. How are we doing so far? Then, then is the great British one, Zebulun. It's Zebulun. You're right. Led Zebulun? Y'all heard of Led Zebulun, right? <laughs> <laughs> that was funny. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and then in parenthesis, who do we have? Joseph. Now, we do something a little bit different because there actually wasn't a tribe named Joseph. Because Joseph got a double portion, so he had two sons. Who were they? Ephraim. Ephraim and Manasseh. Everybody got him? And then the last one was who? Benjamin. You remember, do you remember what happened when he was born? His mother died when he was born. And as, he, as she was dying, she called him Benamai, son of my sorrow. And daddy came in and said, no, we're not going to call him that. We're going to call him Benjamin, son of my right hand. So they changed his name. After those guys, oh, who do we have there? We have Moses. That's the law. Okay? And then after Moses, we have the time of the judges. And who's the most famous judge, not counting Samuel? Samson. That's, Sam that's Samson. What's he doing? He's knocking down the temple of Dagon. Okay? Then you start having kings. And who was the first king? Saul. Followed by who? David. Followed by? Solomon. Okay, then the kingdom divided Solomon, and there was a northern empire, which were ten tribes, and a southern empire, which were two tribes. And the king of the northern empire, anybody know his name? It's Jeroboam. J-E-R-O-B-O-A-M. And who was the king of the southern empire? Rehoboam. R-E-H-O-B-O-A-M. And the northern empire went into captivity to the Assyrians in the year 722. And the southern empire went into captivity to the Babylons in 605. It gets easier because then after that we put prophets. You know what we always do. What do you say about prophets? What do they write about? Judgment and restoration. And then we got the silent years and then we got Jesus and he came to the earth, died on the cross uh, three days and rose again, walked in the earth 40 days, sent into heaven. The Holy Spirit came down on what day? Pentecost. And now we're in what age? The age of the church. And then the church is raptured up, as you see in First Thessalonians 4. And then we start, they put age of the Jew here, but it's the tribulation or Jacob's trouble. And at the three and a half year mark, this person called the what? The Antichrist. Oh, by the way, I just, Oh, well, this is on TV, isn't it? Yeah, it is. I better not, I'm not going to say this. Uh, I'm, uh, no, I can't whisper it. It's just a, a, there's a person that, that you may know that who has written me lately who thinks he's the Antichrist, and he's actually asked to come speak at our church. He says, I humbly present myself as the Antichrist. I'd like to speak to the church. And so I just want you to know that right now we, we ha don't have any plans to have the Antichrist speak <laughs> at the church. I just, Okay. <clears throat> Okay, and then following that time period is what? The thousand-year reign of Christ. Sometimes people call it age of Christ. Sometimes they call it the millennium, the, the kingdom. And then following that is Revelation 21, 22, and the eternal state, the great white throne judgment, then on into the eternal state. So you got it, right? That's the whole timeline. Y'all got everything. You've got, you can divide the Bible into two parts, in six parts, uh, excuse me, five parts, and seven parts, and two parts again, and then... All the different 20 parts, and, and so you got it. Uh, it's tremendous. The memory verses. Oh, boy. Mm. Okay. 
the reason I put this down is because it's John three fourteen through 18, you know. Probably the greatest. It's the greatest verses in the Bible. I mean, should we not memorize as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes has eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. For God didn't send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but the world might be saved through him. He that believes is not condemned. He believes not condemned already. Why? Because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. That's the most important section, really, almost of the Bible. Because if you got that, you can share your faith with anybody. If you only had one verse, what verse would it be? John 3, 16. You can share everything. So why not know the whole little section?